Hey, I want to welcome everyone here today to this episode of The Living Word. Today, we are continuing with teachings from the class um, that is class number five, Persistent Attacks and Sickness. This is part three of that class, and it's about cursed objects. Now, we've already covered um, that object objects can be tainted, and we had that with spiritual influences upon items, and we just kind of glossed over this whole cursed items thing. So we're, we are going to go into deeper detail here today. According to Acts 19, verses 11 and 12, this is the Amplified Classic version, it says, and God did unusual and extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that handkerchiefs or towels or aprons, which had touched his skin, were carried away and put upon the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. In Deuteronomy 7, verse 26, this is the American King James Version. That's what AKJV is, the American King James Version. It says, neither shall you bring an abomination into your house, lest you be a cursed thing like it, but you shall utterly detest it, and you shall ab utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. So as we've discussed, defiled items can be cleansed through the blood of Jesus, but there are some cursed items that cannot be cleared of the curse. We see that Paul's handkerchief carried the anointing of God, the presence of God. Why cannot other objects carry an evil presence or a curse upon them? You see, God is just, and the and this world works under certain principles. So what works for God, well, the enemy can use for his purposes as well. Over the course of years, I have found out that certain physical objects can keep us from receiving revelation from God, focusing or concentrating on the things of God, and receiving healing. These are three items within our life that can be affected by having items with a curse upon it. Remo removing items that are opposed to God's will will deepen our relationship with him. If you are ready to be set free from the enemy interfering with your, with your spiritual life and even your physical health, this is the meeting for you. We've had over the years, we've had many testimonies of freedom coming from removing cursed objects from their homes, including one woman in particular who had chronic joint pain for years and the pain instantly left once a series of books was removed. Now here is a testimony that we received concerning a particular cursed item. This is from Jennifer T. About two years ago, I bought the Passion Translation Bible. TPT. I liked the poetic way it was written and found it easy to read and study. I began having digestive problems and I had an operation a few years prior to this and I thought merely the old problem had resurfaced. Some days eating food was fine. The next day I couldn't swallow food at all, even so much as mashed potatoes. Food would get stuck and I would throw it up after an hour or two. It was very uncomfortable in, once she ate food and it, until she was eventually sick. This would cause my body to go into shock where I would shiver and I'd go to bed for 24 hours. They felt I needed an operation at, as I also had a swollen hiatus hernia along with this problem and I needed corrective surgery. The problem continued to get worse some days not eating or living off of soups. It became so bad that I was afraid to eat and was skipping meals altogether. I continued to read, to study, and to pray for God's healing. The whole problem was getting me down. At intercession prayer, I was asked if I had bought anything recently within this time period of being ill, if I had br brought it into the house. I mentioned the only thing I had brought in the last years were a new Bible, the TPT. 
It was immediately shown to be contaminated. The verses had been changed and omitted. I was very surprised that a Bible could be contaminated. I struggled for a day or two to throw it away. I finally threw it into the recycling, repented and asked God to forgive my ignorance and cleanse me with the blood of Jesus. When it, within a couple of days, my digestion started to improve. Bit by bit, I could eat normally, even mashed potatoes and solids. I've come to realize that by swallowing the wrong words of that book, I was actually causing physical harm to my body. I thank God for the discerning leadership and helping me to see how books could be contaminated, including Bibles. Now, if I see TPT, I have an immediate physical reaction, whether it is an advertisement as a translation or not. Glory be to God. So Jennifer, over the following years, would often experience difficult swallowing. And the, the cause was always she had liked, shared, you know, a post on social media that was a TPT translation. Now, I don't want you to kind of get freaked out about Bible translations. Most of them are just fine. This is the only translation that is just, com it completely waters down, removes the effect effectiveness of the word of God. So I recommend not using this book at all because of this miraculous healing associated with it. If you want to continue growing with God, we need to see this principle about books being contaminated in the word of God. So we're going to go there now. Acts 19.19, 19, American King James. Many of them which, which use curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and they found it was 50,000 pieces of silver. Destroying written words is not a new thing. As long as there have been books or even scrolls, there have been book burnings. This was recorded 2,000 years ago in Acts. God commanded people to destroy the written works of any prophet who spoke presumptuously by saying, not just wrongly teaching, but actually saying, thus saith the Lord. And then the prophecy was proved false. Uh, this shouldn't be confused with misguided teachings. Prophets are human like anyone else. They can be wrong. But they better be careful about saying, thus saith the Lord, because that is the way to have God's hand move off of you. We see the same harsh response to wrong books applied in the New Testament in Acts 19.19 19, with the books that have other spirits upon them. Those were witchcraft books. Why is this? Many Christians read a book and say they can feel the presence of the Holy Spirit upon that book. Is it so inconceivable that a presence of other spirits may be upon books as well? Perhaps this is why God has had his people destroy the writings of people pro proclaiming, thus saith the Lord. Maybe that was according to a wrong spirit. And then reading those, thus saith the Lord, would allow those spirits to move into the life of the people who, re who read them. Now, as one who has loved books for many years, I used to read non-stop, back when I had time to read. <laughs> this was not an easy revelation for me. I believe that that is why God revealed to our church the power of tainted books in a very miraculous way. You've already heard one story. Let's look at a second witness concerning that. It was during a particular meeting with the church that was online where God was revealing that some books about him, some books written about him could hold an, even, an evil spirit. spirit. We talked about this in what we called our tea and coffee meeting where you get to bring questions to us. We also spoke about contaminated objects. As we spoke about contaminated objects, the Holy Spirit led me to bring out a picture for my bedroom for testing. Several people in the meeting were stunned by the level of contamination. They stated what they were feeling in the meeting and said as much. I set aside the picture on, on the desk to deal with it later. 
Now in this meeting, the Holy Spirit was really moving powerfully. And that picture as it sat on the desk, desk next to me, I and I began to pray for others. My nose became more and more stuffy. My eyes began to itch. My throat began to get scratchy. The Holy Spirit told me it was coming from that picture. So I got up. I took that picture and threw it in the trash and all the symptoms disappeared. I had had that same picture in my bedroom for many years. And I, at that time we had a house with a full basement and that was where our bedroom was. I thought there was black mold in the basement because every time I spent time down there, my throat would get itchy, my eyes would get stuffy, you know, or my nose would get stuffy, my eyes would get itchy, my throat was scratchy. But all along, it was that picture. When I had moved to a new home, my throat and my sinuses were fine. When I traveled from the basement to other places, my throat, my nose were fine. It was only when I was in there. And then I, after we moved, I put that picture out. And sure enough, my nose started getting scratchy and I never put it together until then. This was one of the ways that the Holy Spirit brings discernment to me. And it was a very dramatic de demonstration. It's through the nose, through the senses of the face. It's interesting that God healed uh, allergies in my system was one of the first things he did when I came back to him. And it, those are all allergy-like symptoms. Perhaps that's why he cleared those up so I could see when there was a, a presence around. A few weeks after this meeting, there was a member of our church who asked for help. Let's call her Mary. She was in her 90s and had been collecting books for decades. And confusion plagued her mind no matter how much of the Bible she read. She couldn't seem to hold on to new teachings, often asking the same questions over and over. The Holy Spirit suggested to Mary that perhaps there were spirits attached to her books that were contributing to the issue. So you see in the meeting, she had received a physical demonstration that object, objects could be tainted. So I drove 45 minutes to her house on a Saturday to help her discern which books were contaminated. On the way there, the Holy Spirit was speaking strongly. He said to put the books in my car and throw them away for her. For this reason, when Mary told me that her husband might be upset if he found out that she was throwing away boxes of her books in the garbage, I offered to take the books with me in my car. There were four large boxes of books that were tainted by well-known men of God. Why they were tainted? Well, you're going to have to see traps when praying and attacks from people. Those two classes will tell you why these books were tainted from well-known men of God. Not long after I got into my car, my eyes began to itch. And I thought, oh, it's probably, those books probably really dusty, haven't been touched in years. Halfway home, my sinuses were really clogged. It felt like a massive weight upon my face. Then my nose began to bleed and my back ached like I was carrying sandbags on my shoulders for miles. I stopped at a light not far from my house and I began thinking about just one of the books in the boxes. At the time I read it years and years ago, it really helped me understand the power of the blood of Jesus and the name of Jesus. And neglected to say that you should only use these things with guidance from the Holy Spirit. Suddenly, as I contemplated these things, a voice came into my mind and it says, who do you think you are telling people that they need more than the name and the blood of Jesus? I thought, gosh, that was a mean, harsh, condemning thought. Where did that come from? This was not the voice of my counselor who led me to teach on these things just mere weeks before. This was a demonic spirit. Remember, I get discernment through my nose. That's why I got the bloody nose. I've noticed since then, if I get a bloody nose, it's usually there, I'm going in a wrong direction that will bring great harm, or there's something going on that will bring great harm into somebody's life. And the Holy Spirit was warning me that there was a strong evil presence in my car. It took a great amount of self-control not to pull over at the next gas station and just dump them in the dumpster. If those books could have that effect on me, being the leader of the church, 
It's no wonder that Mary was plagued with confusion once she removed these books, the confusion left. After this incident, the Holy Spirit began talking to me about another cursed item or another possibility of trouble about books and gifts together. There's a danger in both of these things. So let's continue about books and then we're going to move on to gifts. With books, we do not want to be religious about getting rid of books. This means we can't feel condemned. We, we don't want to condemn others if they have books. We just want to do what Jesus is bringing to our heart. For this reason, I'm not going to give you a list of which books we have found and discovered have a wrong spirit. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit guide you one step at a time. I will give you this guidance. There is a difference between fiction and nonfiction books. Fiction, by definition, means that you are accepting it as not true. Where nonfiction is claiming that it is a true and an accurate information. This means if you have spiritual nonfiction books, you are accepting this and, and grabbing onto it as being true. A fiction book, well, you're saying this book is fake, it's pretend, it's not true. This makes fiction books a lot less dangerous than nonfiction. There are some fiction books you have to worry about. There can be some dangerous things in them. I'm going to give you a list for that. So here are the dangerous nonfiction, or these are the da dangerous fiction books. If they have actual spells in them, if they have materials that will train young minds in the ways against God, if they have dragons on the cover, or if we are drawn in and we're focusing too much on those and they're just wrapping themselves around our mind. So we know that spells are not right. We know that that's witchcraft. We know that, um, did you know that the Potter series of books contains magic spells that were from real witches and the rich and the, some of the rituals they do were actually done by those worshiping Satan, the witches. Those are probably the most danger, dangerous of all fiction books. I, my kids grew up at the time when those series, that series was coming out and was very popular. During the first 12 years of their life, I established God's ways with them and I would not let them watch that series or read those books. However, when they were over the age of 12, 12 is the age of accountability. By that time, they should be able to recognize good from evil. Then I let them make their own choice for themselves. Both of my kids only watched the first movie, some part of the second, and they lost interest. They weren't captivated by it like the rest of the world. So watch your non, your fiction books. We know that Satan is called that old dragon in the Bible. So when you have a picture of a dragon on something, it's kind of like acknowledging him in a way. And it may allow something into your life. So just be cautious there. In the book of Romans, chapters 5 through 7, we are not going to read all of that here today. But it speaks about how the law, the, the law which is good, God's law, the Ten Commandments, it can tempt man into sin because it states you cannot do this. When there are rules, many are tempted to see if they can get away with breaking them. It kind of tempts them with that forbidden fruit that seems alluring. I've heard stories of kids whose parents forbid them many things. Then when they get out of the house, they go wild. You see, I didn't want a series of books to create that desire within my kids. This is why I let them be exposed to it under my protection and under my roof. We must be careful about putting rules out there for people. Now, I've told you and I've pointed out one series that is bad and I've given you a personal example of why. But we don't want to condemn people if they 
are going in that direction. They may not know better. We have to let the Holy Spirit bring it to people in their own time. The book burning days back in the last century, the book burning days of fiction may have been very well meant, but I think it accomplished a little more than giving into a religious spirit. Many people went out and bought those same fiction books because they wanted to see what all the fuss was about. So tend to your own life. Talk to the Holy Spirit about what is right for you. Now, nonfiction books, those are a different matter altogether. As the book of Acts states, burning may be necessary for some of those books. And I don't, don't look at burning as, um, don't look at burning books as, it's as something you have to do. No, it's it was a destruction of the books so no one else could use them. And the most expedient way then was to burn them. You could possibly just throw them in the trash. So let's not get religious. Let's um, just do as the Holy Spirit guides us. So here is more scripture. Second John 2 verses 1 or chapter 1 verses 10 through 11. This is the AMP version. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, but diminishes or adds to the doctrine of Christ, do not receive or welcome him into your house and do not give him a greeting or any encouragement or the one who gives him the greeting or encourages him or wishes him success unwittingly participates in the evil deeds. Did you know that supporting someone who is giving a wrong teaching that detracts from Christ that isn't lined up with Jesus, that supporting them can make you guilty of the same sin. It can, it, to a lesser degree, but it can allow trouble into your life. This verse clearly states that if we accept them, encourage them in any way, we can be affected. There are many ways that we can encourage those who are teaching and leading people into danger. We can attend their church or their meetings. We can purchase their books. Purchasing books and owning them is a way of encouraging them. We can subscribe to their blog or their social media. We can like and share their posts as well. We can be a member or a partner in their ministry. And also if we give physically tithes and offerings to them, we are also joined with them. By supporting people who are leading others astray, you are compliant in their sin. Now, I'm not saying to leave your church or, or anything like that, just like this. I'm saying pray and ask God to grant them wisdom. If you are learning in the free online classes and you see something, you're like, oh my gosh, this has led so many people astray. This Here is the word of God and my church is doing it all wrong. Don't you, you know, don't immediately shake the dust off your feet unless the Holy Spirit tells you to. He may want you to send the leadership a message with some scripture to back up where they've gone wrong. You know, we are the body of Christ and we should be able to share the word of God with each other. And even you should share with leaders. Leaders are not perfect. We need your help. If the leader doesn't correct the issue, and then if the Holy Spirit tells you to, then it may be time for you to shake the dust off your feet according to what the Holy Spirit says for your life. Now, the biggest danger in, in this area is walking in what we call unauthorized authority because you will be guilty by association. There is a miraculous story in the class Traps When Praying that demonstrate how a congregation can be affected if they're joining in with unauthorized authority. So that's in the Removing Attacks course and it's free. I would suggest that you take a look there and consider where you're going to church. So many books have unauthorized authority in them. So you'll have to go and look at that class. So you can see where the danger lies and, and let the Holy Spirit minister to you. Any book that tells us to trust in a certain prayer or a ritual, instead of telling us to rely on the leading and the guiding of the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God that Jesus has sent to us. Anyone that says, any, any book that encourages you to do, just do this, that, the other thing, and then you're good. 
Well, that is provoking us to pride. See the new and old wineskin class in identifying the enemy about that. We have discerned the spirit of Leviathan working through certain prayer books. You need to learn God's ways so you can stay clear of these dangers from well-respected, well-meaning leaders in the body of Christ. Several people have become instantly healed by removing certain books from their homes. Remember, we are the body of Christ. Jesus is our head. Would you want your mouth speaking, declaring, decreeing without your head telling it to do so? In the natural world, this is orders known as Tourette's syndrome. But unfortunately, the body of Christ is suffering from this condition as well. You need to learn about that. Go to the classes because they'll give you scripture after scripture to support this. What is right for one situation may not be right for another. Just because you see it in the word doesn't mean God wants you to do it exactly that way right now. We must ask him. Jesus is our leader. He only did what he saw and heard his father doing. When Jesus walked the earth, his disciples asked if they should call down fire on those who were preaching about Jesus, preaching about him, but they were not associated with Jesus. And he said, no, not at this time. Again, where those are located in the word of God, you'll find in the traps. When praying, of course, just ask yourself this. Would an earthly king appreciate it if you he gave you his name and then you began using that name for whatever you thought was right at the moment? Maybe he had decreed something differently and you were fighting his own decree. Would he want you just to use it for the things that he authorized you it for? I hope these things have given you a little bit to think about and to consider and that you'll go and look at those other classes. I will give you one, one, only one scripture to back this up. And let's look at that here today because I want it big and bold before you. Romans 8, 14, English Standard Version. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. We must be led by the Holy Spirit. Then we will know what to ask in Jesus' name. Then we will know and it will be done. So now let's get back on to the topic of the books. Which books should you get rid of? I will only give you one at this moment. If you were here and with this ministry or on Kindle or someplace else, Back in 2018, you may have the first edition of the book called Keys to Authority. Here, let me get it for you. This is what it looks like, but it's by Lynn Hardy. It's by me. This first edition needs to be thrown out. I wrote it back before I knew all this about authority. I wrote it according to the, the teachings of the word of faith that what I grew up with and the Holy Spirit had me throw it out. Here, let me see. Um, here on the copyright page, you should see 2018, 2019. As long as you see 2019, it is the book that you can keep. If you've bought it on Kindle or got, downloaded a free copy, all you have to do is go to your Amazon account, ask them to refresh it, and you have to select refresh it, and then, or possibly just get rid of it and then buy it again, because <laughs> it's, it's free, there's no charge for it. And then that will refresh your Kindle copy. We are all learning and growing together. When I began in ministry in 2018, the Lord brought revelation after revelation as I looked for confirmation in his word of what I had been taught. And now I'm passing that on to you. Let's go back to the word of God and see about gifts. Are you ready to learn about gifts that could be cursed? Genesis 14, 23, Amplified Classic Version. I would not take a thread or a shoelace or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. This is a verse from the Old Testament after Abram had won a battle and fought with three kings. He declined to receive anything from them. No gifts, no parting, no parting things. He knew that taking a gift from someone would confirm or, or make a wrong connection between him and that person. 
It is the heart and the intent of the giver that creates, that can create a negative influence from an item. Specifically for gifts, the only thing you need to worry about is if someone has spoken against you, against your destiny with God, you should ask the Holy Spirit before receiving any gifts from them. Now, like all the other revelations from God, he showed this in a miraculous way. He showed me how detrimental it could be to receive a wrong gift that it could allow the enemy to hinder you. If I hadn't experienced this miracle to show me the truth, I may not have believed it. <laughs> I might have been like, really God? Um, but I'm going to share it with you today because I want you to understand that there is a danger. There, the spiritual realm, remember, all things in this world came from the spiritual realm. It's actually more powerful than our realm, than the physical realm, though we cannot see it. So influences from the spiritual realm can hinder us. Before I go into this story about tainted gifts, let's look at it in the word of God. 2 Kings 5, the whole chapter of 5, tells a story that may shed some light on this. It's a long chapter, so I'm not. I'm going to summarize it here for you today. But please take time to go back and read it for yourself if you're able. There was this king who had leprosy and tried to buy a healing from God's people by sending gifts to the king of, of Israel. The prophet Elisha heard this and demanded the man come to him so that God could prove that it was his power, not the power of the king. Oh, no, oh sorry, it wasn't a king. It was a king's servant. So there was a king's servant who had leprosy. So Elisha told the king's servant to go and dunk himself in the Jordan seven times and he would be healed. This was very humbling. The, king, the, the king's servant was really upset because that Elijah just didn't wave his hand and, and let, the, let the healing come. However, his, the servant of the servant convinced him to do as the prophet said. I mean, he literally said, what? You know, you want me to go dunk in that dirty river, the Jordan? We have much better rivers in my land. I, you know, why am I going to do that? He actually left, determined not to do what the prophet said. But on the way, the person traveling with him convinced him, maybe you should give it a try. You really want to be healed, don't you? Right? So the servant went and dunked himself in the river, and he was healed. And he returned to Elisha, and he offered him a whole bunch of gold and, and, and stuff and clothes and all this valuable things. But the prophet refused to take it. So then the king or the king's servant declared he would only offer sacrifices to the God of Israel because now he knew that was the true power. After the king's servant, after the king's servant left, Elisha's servant, his disciple, ran after him and asked him for, for some of the stuff he was trying to give to Elisha. And Elisha cursed that servant with leprosy. The Lord revealed to Elisha what his servant had done, and he wound up with the same disease the other guy had. You see, miracles shouldn't be bought. Elisha knew that accepting a payment would lessen the glory that God would receive at that moment. Does it mean that anyone who prays for somebody to be healed shouldn't receive an offering given? No. But Elisha knew this person's heart. When God said, don't do it, don't touch what's coming from this person because God wanted to move in. Elisha obeyed, but the servant didn't. And he disobeyed and he received something. And with it, he received a curse. Remember, both Paul, Peter, and Jesus's garments, well, connection to them, heal people. So Jesus, remember, they had to just touch the fringe of Jesus's garment. That's in Luke 8, verses 40 and 48, and then they were healed. Han handkerchiefs and aprons from Paul would heal people. So objects can carry an anointing and influence. They can also carry a negative spiritual influence, such as a curse. Here's where it's mentioned in the New Testament, just so you don't think that this is something only in the Old Testament. It says in Jude 1, verse 23, Amplified Classic Version, Strive to save others, snatching them out of the fire. 
on others take pity, but with fear, loathing even the garments spotted by the flesh and polluted by their sensuality. It is clear that though we should try and help the lost, there must be a distance kept from them until they shake off those influences. Remember, they, they're warning against taking things from those who are still struggling to be free of sensuality. That's lust. You know, uh, the flesh is also known as sin. So their garments and what they were wearing was contaminated by that sin. And, and Jude is warning, don't partake of that. Be leery of that. Paul told the Corinthians that food sacrificed to idols was fine to eat as long as you had the faith to do so. However, he warned them not to let them, their freedom to eat food sacrificed to idols become a stumbling block for other Christians. This is not the same as accepting a gift from someone. The food was a necessary item for their survival and they had to have it. And it was purchased by that person, by the Christian. Therefore, they took it into their possession with their authority. A gift is on a different level. A gift is something that you accept and you receive from another. If you are very aware, if that person has made it very clear about their negative feelings for you or for your destiny especially, then you will be accepting that person's opinion with the gift. Here is my real life example. I received a gift from someone, let's call her Rachel. They hadn't been in my life for too long, but despite the many, many miracles that had been associated with my calling, she was having trouble with it. She actually told me and, and declared that there's no way God could choose me for this job. That, that God chose wrong. Well, that was a strong rebuke. And I renounced those words and plead the blood over them. I don't come into agreement with them, Jesus. I'm just repeating what she said. This was her opinion about me. I was very aware of this. I also knew that the Lord was freeing her from a Jezebel spirit. Well, Rachel sent me a Christmas gift. On that very same day, I came down with this awful cold. The present was in my garage for a couple of days before it was brought into the house. And as it was, things became worse. My throat was so sore I could hardly swallow. I hadn't felt like this in years. No, no medicine would touch the symptoms. The Holy Spirit brought the gift to mind and the fact that I'd gotten sick when I received it. So I brought the gift out and began looking at it and asking the Holy Spirit about it. Immediately, I had that sensation and I knew that this was the problem. I tried pleading the blood over it, severing soul ties, nothing worked. It was still felt, I could feel the wrongness. I said, shoot, I think I guess I got to get rid of this. As soon as I accepted that and said those words, the pain in my throat left. It was instantly gone. And I said, oh no, the Holy Spirit, you just confirmed that this is what I have to do. So I put the gift in the garage. I still had a little bit of yuckiness in my, in my nose, but nothing like before. 90% was gone. I pursued the Holy Spirit and I said, why is it 90% healing? Why isn't the whole thing healed? And he said that that 10% was the original natural sickness. The 90% was what the enemy did, what, what he brought and what he added to that situation. Who knew a gift could bring such an attack? We should always listen to the Holy Spirit when receiving a gift, ask his direction. We don't want to be rude to the person. It might just be something we pass on to someone else. <laughs> but um, if we, you know, if we can't politely decline, should you try and anoint items that come into your house? Well, Remember, the anointing is used to dedicate it for God's use. If it's not an item you want to dedicate to God only for his use, don't ask for the anointing. Just ask for the blood to cleanse it and sever soul ties with at all those who came before it. After this happened, the next day I spent time worshiping and thanking God for all he had done. I thank Jesus for being my healer and my provider. By the end of, of the day, I was 100% totally healed. Sometimes that is the missing agreement in, in, um, ingredient. Sometimes we forget to worship and thank God, even when it's only a partial breakthrough. Through prayer, the enemy's attack 
can be removed from your life. After that, you need to draw close to God and let him bring any final pieces into place. Now, removing the curse, as I said I did, or tried to do with that item, is pretty simple. If it's a defiled object to see if it's a curse that can be broken by the blood, what you need to do is this. It can, it's so easy. The Lord has done all that we need to do. You just simply state, Lord, I want to be holy unto you as you are holy. For your word says, be holy as I am holy. I take the sword of the Spirit and I cut all soul ties with anyone who made this item, sold it, shipped it. I renounce all covenants over this item, which because it is now mine and I am in covenant with you. I renounce all unholy curse words spoken over it. Lord, redeem this with your blood for it is mine and I am yours. That simple. That is what our Lord has done for us. We can pray over that which has been defiled. Only a few things are cursed beyond the ability of Jesus to redeem. We talked about that in the, in the spiritual influences meeting. So go back and review that if you want to see the list of things that cannot be redeemed. Most of the time, our God is good and he will redeem it with his blood because we are his. That is the meeting we have for you here today. For those of you who are alive, do you have any questions that you would like to bring forward about this message? Go ahead and send them into our um, co-host or just post them. Or if you'd like to raise your hand, you can you can raise your hand and ask. Um, to the co-host, to the helpers who are here, are there any questions concerning this material? Okay, go right ahead. Does that apply to ebooks? Yes, you should still get rid of them, even if they're ebooks. Remember, let the Holy Spirit guide you about what you're ready for. Do the free online classes at the Online Christian Church. That's onlinechristianchurch.com. And it'll take you through some danger zones, traps when praying, or, or what allows the enemy to attack Christians most often. Um, identifying the enemy will show you how curses can travel down a family line and, and a few things that you'll need to know there. Um, the attacks from people course is really good because it'll show you why some of even books from some of God's leaders may be contaminated. So, so let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart. There is no condemnation from each other because as Christians, we're all growing, we're all in different stages and it's up to you to talk to the Holy Spirit and to apply this to your life. Then let's pray and thank the Lord for his word. Jesus, we just thank you. We praise you, Jesus, for your spirit, who, who is our teacher, our counselor, and our guide. We thank you for bringing us wisdom about your ways. We thank you, Lord, that as we are obedient to your ways, as we are obedient um, to your spirit, that you remove, remove the enemy from our lives one step at a time. Oh, Lord, I just ask that you bring wisdom to each person who hears this message or listens to it later or does the class online. Speak strongly to them. I thank you for this. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. That is the message for today. Shalom.